matrimony, the sacrament of fidelity and procreation. No religion proclaimed the indissolubility of marriage until the coming of Christ. Every major break with the Catholic Church has been over indissolubility. America, although representing only 6% of Catholics worldwide, accounts for well over 50% of all annulments. How can loyal Catholics protect their faith in such a climate? Where is America going? Let's hear it from Father Harton. Suppose we begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Holy Family. Pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our present conference is on matrimony, the sacrament of fidelity and procreation. Of all the seven sacraments, matrimony has been the most widely challenged in the history of the Catholic Church. It has also been the main cause of disunity in Christianity. We know this from the classic narrative described by St. Matthew when some Pharisees came to test Jesus by asking him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any cause? When he answered them, Have you not read that the Creator from the beginning made them male and female and said, For well, this cause? A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore, now that they are no longer two but one flesh, let no man put asunder what God has joined together. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a written notice of dismissal and put his wife away? Jesus said to them, Because Moses, by reason of the hardness of your heart, permitted you to put away your wives, it was not so from the beginning. And I say to you, there were puts away his wife, except for immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. He who marries a woman who has been put away, commits adultery. In the Gospel of St. Mark, Christ declares how the same law applies to women. Says Jesus, if the wife puts away her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Over the centuries, this has been the single principal cause for whole nations breaking with the Catholic Church. In the 13th century, the Orthodox churches broke with Rome over this issue. In the 16th century, this was the main reason for the rise of Protestantism. That is why the Council of Trent condemned the following proposition as heresy. I read, If anyone says that the Church is in error for having taught and for still teaching that in accordance with the evangelical an apostolic doctrine, the marriage bond cannot be dissolved because of adultery on the part of one of the spouses, and that neither of the two, not even the innocent one, who has given no cause for infidelity, can contract 
another marriage, during the lifetime of the other, and the husband who dismisses an adulterous wife and marries again, and the wife who dismisses an adulterous husband and marries again, are both guilty of adultery. Let him be anathema. Obviously, if even open adultery cannot justify divorce and remarriage, there are no other grounds for dissolving a Christian marriage are recognized by the authentic, honest to God Catholic Church. Christ elevates marriage. Until God became man in the person of Jesus Christ, no religion forbade divorce and remarriage. For that matter, every religion, even Judaism, not only allowed married people to leave their spouse, but even practiced polygamy. That is why, after Christ told the Pharisees that remarriage was forbidden, the disciples told him, I quote, If this is the case of a man with his wife, it seems better not to marry. What did Jesus Christ do when he told his followers? They not only may not, they cannot divorce and remarry. He was restoring marriage to its original state before the fall of our first parents. We must say that Christ had no choice. Having restored the state of marriage to its condition before the fall of the human race, and husband and wife are to be two, and only two, in one flesh. Jesus just had to provide, in strict justice, the means necessary to live out his humanly impossible command. A lifetime fidelity in marriage is what we call a moral miracle. Jesus met the need for obtaining superhuman grace by instituting the sacrament of matrimony. The Catholic Church therefore believes that when marriage between two baptized persons, it is always a sacrament two Baptists, two Presbyterians, two baptized Lutherans marry, they always receive the sacrament of matrimony. Christ himself instituted the sacrament during his visible stay on earth. Consequently, he was not merely introduced into the church by human authority, And the preferred name for the sacrament of marriage is matrimony. However, matrimony is not only a contract between husband and wife. In other contracts, two or more persons can agree on a course of action, and there the matter may end. Not so with Christian marriage. The marrying partners not only agree to take each other as husband and wife, but also to continue taking each other until death. Again, they agree to begin to live with one another in the most intimate union possible 
between two people, and they agree to share their respective lives with one another. And I mean share their lives not just in body, but in soul. There should be no secrets between husband and wife. They also agree to accept whatever children God may send them by forming a family. If all the institutions worthy of the name are established societies, especially those of a public character, marriage is not only an institution, it is the basic, fundamental institution of human society on which all other societies finally depend. I might just add this. At the heart of Marxism is the denial of the family. The family for Karl Marx and his followers, the family was an invention of masculine domination of women. And as I told the audience in Chicago about a month ago, the most powerful Marxist nation in the world today is the United States. Now, the marital ritual. The new marriage rite, St. Vatican II, fulfills the provision that the sacramental grace and duties of the marrying partners be clearly understood. There are no less than five prayers addressed to the Heavenly Father, asking Him for the graces which the husband and wife will need all the days of their life here on earth. First, Praying for the graces of matrimony. And now the prayer. Father, by your power, you have made everything out of nothing. In the beginning, you created the universe and mankind in your own likeness. You gave man the constant help of woman so that man and woman should no longer be two, but one flesh. How you teach us that what you have united may never be divided. Unquote the first prayer. Second prayer. Marriage as a sign of Christ's union with the church. Father, you have made the union of man and woman so holy a mystery that it symbolizes the marriage of Christ and his church. Unquote the prayer. Again, a petition for holiness in marriage. Father, by your plan, man and woman are united. And marriage has been established as the one blessing that was not forfeited by original sin or washed away in the flood. Again, unquote the prayer. Next prayer, love in the wife. The prayer, look with love upon this woman, your daughter. Now join to her husband in marriage. She asked your blessing. Give her the grace of love and peace. 
May she always follow the example of the holy women whose praises are sung in the sacred scriptures. Next prayer, love in the husband. May the husband put his trust in her and recognize that she is his equal and they are with him in the life of grace. May you always honor her and love her as Christ loves his bride of the church. Closing prayer. Mutual fidelity and children. Father, keep them always true to your commandments. Keep them faithful in marriage and let them be living examples of Christian life. Give them the strength which comes from the gospel so they may be witnesses of Christ to others. Bless them with children and help them to be good parents. May they live to see their children's children and after a happy old age grant them fullness of life for the saints in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. So goes the ritual in the sacrament of matrimony. Now, the purpose of marriage. It is impossible to exaggerate the importance of selfless love in marriage. And I mean totally selfless love. This love is first of all to be unity of love. Unity of love is so basic that without it there would be no valid marriage. That is one reason why so-called mixed marriages are hazardous to marital unity. If there is one thing that husband and wife should share in common is their mutual Catholic faith. Most Catholics, I honestly believe, look casually on what they call mixed marriages. And it is increasingly rare to find more than a few pieces of literature on the subject. Yet, no other phenomenon is more common in Europe and the Americas, and none has more lasting implications for the welfare, not only of the Catholic Church, but of Western society. All the learned books on Christianity, and within Christianity on Catholicism, are so much rapid theory unless those who write these books take stock what is happening in real life, which means especially in the institution and practice of marriage. At the heart of Protestantism is the denial, absolute denial, that Jesus Christ instituted the sacrament of matrimony. Moreover, no part in the domination of the world, none, believes that marriage cannot be dissolved with the right to quotes remarry. Not once, but as often as a nominally married husband and wife want to. And Judaism has not changed since the Pharisees challenged Christ on the right of a man to divorce and remarry. Islam, almost one billion Muslims in the world, not only believes in divorce and remarriage, but universally believes in and legislates polygamy. In every constitution 
a very Muslim country in the world. It is therefore impossible to overstate the importance of husband and wife sharing the same Catholic faith and practicing this faith throughout their married lives. However, this unity of love between the spouses is possible only, only, only through the grace of God. This grace is assured by the sacrament of matrimony, but this title to grace must be sustained through the practice of it, a fervent daily prayer, and the reception of both sacraments of the Eucharist and of penance. And that's part one of the kind of love that should obtain in marriage, unity of love. However, the purpose of marriage is also to foster procreative love. This means that marriage is divinely intended to animate the selfless love of husband and wife to want to have children. How important that verb is, to want to have children. Unlike unity of love, which provides for their mutual affection for each other. Procreative love makes them desire to cooperate with each other in bringing offspring into the world and caring for and educating their children, what the church calls spiritual procreation. Once married people believe this, well, they better believe it. They are called upon to practice nothing less than heroic charity to reproduce themselves. This reproduction is not only to procreate children in body for this world, but also and especially to reproduce themselves in spirit or reunion with their families in a heavenly eternity. At this point in preparing the conference, I said a prayer. I asked our Lord for light, whether I should include something in this conference about contraception. What I have to say will be short, but most important. Contraception. This year is the 30th anniversary of the publication by Paul Paul VI of his encyclical Humanae <coughs> Vitae, which forbids contraception as a mortal sin. No single document in modern papal history has provoked more controversy and opposition than Humanae Vitae. In one country after another, Kathy Bishop's conferences met in solemn sessions to pass judgment on this papal teaching. Thank God. Many of these conferences fully approved what the Vicar of Christ declared. However, there were also many Episcopal conferences that rejected this infallible doctrine of Christian morality. And among the bishops' conferences, 
have rejected the Pope's teaching was the Conference of Bishops of the United States. Let me quote just two essential paragraphs of Humanae Vitae. I'm quoting. In conformity with the Christian view of marriage, we must again declare that the direct interruption of the generative process already begun and above all, directly willed and procured abortion, even for therapeutic reasons, are to be absolutely excluded as the given means of regulating birth, equally to be excluded as the teaching authority of the Church has often declared is direct sterilization whether permanent or temporary, whether of the man or of the woman. Similarly excluded is every action which either in anticipation of the conjugal act or in its accomplishment or in the development of its natural consequences proposes whether as a purpose or as a means to render procreation impossible. In other words, every form of contraception is a mortal sin. Over the years I've given graduate courses a whole semester on the history of contraception. Only those countries will retain the Catholic Church, where the bishops, dear Lord, enlighten the bishops, where the bishops teach this papal infallible doctrine. Pope Paul VI had no illusions. Shortly after Humanae Vitae, in July of 19. 68. Paul VI wrote, How many times we have trembled before the alternatives of an easy condescension to current opinions. Unquote. No wonder the same Pope, Paul VI, never published another encyclical for the next ten years until his death in 1978. As he told a bishop friend of mine, every time I go to bed, I think myself wearing a crown of thorns. Talk about God's Marvelous Providence. The single strongest defender of Onamite among the bishops was Cardinal Wojtyła, who was elected the next Pope, John Paul II. 